Hello and happy, it's a Wednesday for me. Um, I, it's the Wednesday before Christmas, more specifically, close out of some of these things. Um, we're about to go out of town, so I've been making sure that I have something to do when we are back in town, um, or while we're out of town. So I downloaded like, I have this fancy spreadsheet I use for like prepping books now. Um, fancy. It just has a bunch of VLOOKUPs, so like when I type characteristics of a character, it pulls it down into all the chapters that I type that character's name into. Um, because, um, I have to like refresh myself on voices, or like occasionally, you know, you'll read a book and like, someone will be talking, but it'll be like, the voice sounded familiar, and you're like, who is that voice? And then you'll find out later in the chapter who that voice is. Yeah, I have to know the first time that they talk in the chapter, not way down the road. Um, unless it's a case of where you want it to be a disguised voice or whatever, but, um, yeah, so I keep track of what characters talk and in what order and what chapters, for instances like that, and I like to keep their characteristics, like this person has a deep voice or this person is blonde or nice or whatever. Okay. New... of dreams. We're doing chapter 18, which I was supposed to do yesterday, but I ran out of time. <sighs> Maybe I'll finally get all the Emma chapters with the right intros and outros over Christmas break. Um, it's Wednesday before Christmas for me. We go out of town the Monday after Christmas, which is the day after Christmas. <clears throat> Let me take a drink real quick. Oops, I just almost knocked my tea over. That would have been bad. I have... Pumpkin chai. Which is slightly weird. I prefer the vanilla chai, but I bought it, so I'm going to use it. Chapter 18. Spring days. The ice in the harbor grew black and rotten in the March suns. In April, there were blue waters and a windy white-capped gulf again. And again, the four winds light begemmed the twilights. I'm so glad to see it once more, said Anne, on the first evening of its reappearance. I've missed it so all winter. The northwestern sky has seemed black and lonely without it. The land was tender with brand new golden green baby leaves. There was an emerald mist on the woods beyond the glen. The seaward valleys were full of fairy mists at dawn. Vibrant winds came and went with salt foam in their breath. The sea laughed and flashed and preened and allured like a beautiful coquettish woman. The herring schooled and the fishing village woke to life. The harbor was alive with white sails making for the channel. The ships began to sail outward and inward again. On a spring day like this, said Anne, I know exactly what my soul will feel like on the resurrection morning. Captain Jim's voice. There are times in spring when I sort of feel like I might have been a poet if I'd been caught young, remarked Captain Jim. I catch myself conning over old lines and verses I heard the schoolmaster reciting sixty years ago. They don't trouble me at other times. Now I feel as if I had to get out on the rocks or the fields or the water and spout them. Captain Jim had come up that afternoon to bring Anne a load of shells for her garden, and a little bunch of sweet grass which had found in a ramble over the s he had found. and a little bunch of sweet grass which he had found in a ramble over the sand dunes. It's getting real scarce along this shore now, he said. When I was a boy, there was a plenty of it. But now it's only once in a while you'll find a plot, and never when you're looking for it. You just have to stumble on it. You're walking along on the sand hills, never thinking of sweet grass, and all at once the air is full of sweetness, and there's the grass under your feet. I favored the smell of sweet grass. It always makes me think of my mother. She was fond of it? asked Anne. Now that I knows on. Not. Not that I knows on. Don't knows that. Oh my gosh. 
Don't know if she ever saw any sweet grass. No, it's because it has a kind of motherly perfume. Not too young, you understand. Something kind of seasoned and wholesome and dependable, just like a mother. The schoolmaster's bride always kept it among her handkerchiefs. You might put that little bunch among yours, Mistress Blythe. I don't like these Bofton's Bowton. I don't like these Bowton scents, but a whiff of sweet grass belongs anywhere a lady does. Anne had not been especially enthusiastic over the idea of surrounding her flower beds with quahog shells. As a decoration, they did not appeal to her on first thought. But she would not have hurt Captain Jim's feelings for anything. So she assumed a virtue she did not at first feel, and thanked him heartily. And when Captain Jim had proudly encircled every bed with a rim of the big milk-white shells... That sounded weird. And when Captain Jim had proudly encircled every bed with a rim of the big, milk-white shells, Anne found to her surprise that she liked the effect. On a town lawn, or even up at the Glen, they would not have been in keeping. But here, in the old-fashioned sea-bound garden of the little house of dreams, they belonged. They do look nice, she said sincerely. The schoolmaster's bride always had cowhawks round her beds, said Captain Jim. She was a master hand with flowers. She looked at em and touched em so, and they grew like mad. Some folks have that knack. I reckon you have it too, Mistress Blythe. Oh, I don't know. But I love my garden, and I love working in it. To potter with green, growing things, watching each day to see the dear new sprouts come up. It's like taking a hand in creation, I think. Just now my garden is like faith, the substance of things hoped for, but by a we. It always amazes me to look at the little wrinkled brown seeds and think of the rainbows in them, said Captain Jim. When I ponder on them seeds, I don't find it nowise hard to believe that we've got souls that'll live in other worlds. You couldn't hardly believe there was life in them tiny things, some no bigger than grains of dust, let alone color and scent. If you hadn't seen the miracle, could you? And who was counting her days like silver beads on a rosary, could not now take the long walk to the lighthouse or up the Glen Road. But Miss Cornelia and Captain Jim came very often to the little house. Miss Cornelia was the joy of Anne's and Gilbert's existence. They laughed side-splittingly over her speeches after every visit. When Captain Jim and she happened to visit the little house at the same time, there was much sport for the listening. They waged wordy warfare, she attacking, he defending. Anne once reproached the captain for his baiting of Miss Cornelia. Oh, I do love to set her going, Mistress Blythe, chuckled the unrepentant sinner. It's the greatest amusement I have in life. That tongue of hers would blister a stone, and you and that young dog of a doctor enjoy listening to her as much as I do. You know what I think I forgot to do? <clears throat> undo that um let me open this real quick i forgot today we'll be continuing Anne's house of dreams by lucy maud montgomery um i forgot that part all right, we're going to clip it here and insert it. I don't know what made me think of that, but I was like, there's something missing. Okay, now we need to hide that. Um, we are not armed. There we go. Captain Jim came along another evening to bring Anne some mayflowers. The garden was full of the moist, scented air. <coughs> Excuse me. Captain Jim came along another evening to bring Anne some mayflowers. The garden was full of the moist, scented air of a maritime spring evening. There was a milk-white mist on the edge of the sea with a young moon kissing it, and a silver gladness of stars over the glen. 
The bell of the church across the harbor was ringing dreamily sweet. The mellow chime drifted through the dusk to mingle with the soft spring moan of the sea. Captain Jim's Mayflowers added the last completing touch to the charm of the night. I haven't seen any this spring, and I've missed them, said Anne, burying her face in them. They ain't to be found around four winds, only in the barrens away behind the glen up yonder. I took a little trip today to the land of nothing to do, and hunted these up for you. I reckon they're the last you'll see this spring, for they're nearly done. How kind and thoughtful you are, Captain Jim. Nobody else. Not even Gilbert. With a shake of her head. Uh -uh. With a shake of her head at him. Remembered that I always long for Mayflowers in spring. Well, I had another errand, too. I wanted to take Mr. Howard back yonder a mess of trout. He likes one occasional. And it's all I can do for a kindness he did me once. I stayed all the afternoon and talked to him. He likes to talk to me, though he's a highly educated man and I'm only an ignorant old sailor. Oh my god. Though he's a highly educated man and I'm only an ignorant old sailor. Because he's one of the folks that's got to talk or they're miserable. And he finds listeners scarce around here. The Glen folks fight shy of him because they think he's an infidel. He ain't that far gone exactly. Few men is, I reckon. But he's what you might call a heretic. Heretics are wicked, but they're mighty interesting. It's just that they've got sorted loss looking for God, being under the impression that he's hard to find. Which he ain't, never. Most of them blunder to him after a while, I guess. I don't think listening to Mr. Howard's arguments is likely to do me much harm. Mind you, I believe what I was brought up to believe. It saves a vast of bother. And back of it all, God is good. The trouble with Mr. Howard is that he's a little too clever. He thinks that he's bound to live up to his cleverness. And that it's smarter to thrash out some new way of getting to heaven than to go by the old track the common ignorant folks is traveling. But he'll get there sometime all right. And then he'll laugh at himself. Mr... Mr. Howard was a Methodist to begin with, said Miss Cornelia, as if she thought he had not far to go from that to heresy. Did you know? Do you know? Do you know, Cornelia, said Captain Jim gravely. I've often thought that if I wasn't a Presbyterian, I'd be a Methodist. Oh, well, conceded Miss Cornelia. If you weren't a Presbyterian, it wouldn't matter much what you were. Speaking of heresy... Reminds me, Doctor. I've brought back that book you lent me, that natural law in the spiritual world. I didn't read more than a third of it. I can read sense and I can read nonsense, but that book is neither the one nor the other. It is considered rather her heretical. It is considered rather heretical in some quarters, admitted Gilbert. But I told you that before you took it, Miss Cornelia. Oh, I wouldn't have minded its being heretical. I can stand wickedness, but I can't stand foolishness, said Miss Cornelia calmly, and with the air of having said the last thing there was to say about natural law. Speaking of books, a mad love come to an end at last two weeks ago, remarked Captain Jim musingly. I had run to 103 chapters. When they got married, the book stopped right off, so I reckon their troubles were all over. It's real nice that that's the way in books anyhow, isn't it? Even if tisn't so anywhere else. I've never read novels, said Miss Cornelia. Did you hear how Geordie Russell was today, Captain Jim? Yes, I called in on my way home to see him. He's getting round all right, but stewing in a broth of trouble as usual, poor man. Of course, he brews a... Mm. But still him. Excuse me. Of course, he brews up most of it for himself. But I reckon that don't make it any easier to bear. He is an awful pessimist, said Miss Cornelia. Well, no, he ain't a pessimist exactly, Cornelia. He only just never finds anything that suits him. And isn't that a pessimist? No, no. A pessimist is one who never expects to find anything to suit him. Geordie hain't got that far yet. You'd find something good to say of the devil himself, Jim Boyd. Well, you've heard the story of the old lady who said he was persevering. But no, Cornelia, I've nothing good to say of the devil. Do you believe in him at all? asked Miss Cornelia seriously. 
How can you ask that when you know what a good Presbyterian I am, Cornelia? How could a Presbyterian get along without a devil? Do you? persisted Miss Cornelia. Captain Jim suddenly became grave. I believe in what I heard a minister once call a mighty and malignant and intelligent power of evil working in the universe, he said solemnly. I do that, Cornelia. You can call it the devil, or the principle of evil, or the old scratch, or any name you like. It's there, and all the infidels and heretics in the world can't argue it away, any more than they can argue God away. It's there, and it's working. But mind you, Cornelia, I believe it's going to get the worst of it in the long run. I'm sure I hope so, said Miss Cornelia, none too hopefully. But speaking of the devil... I'm positive that Billy Booth is possessed by him now. Have you heard of Billy's latest performance? No, what was that? He's gone and burned up his wife's new brown broadcloth suit that she paid $25 for in Charlottetown, because he declares the men looked too admiring at her when she wore it to church the first time. Wasn't that like a man? Mistress Booth is mighty pretty, and browns her color, said Captain Jim reflectively. Is that any good reason why he should poke her new suit into the kitchen stove? Billy Booth is a jealous fool, and he makes his wife's life miserable. She's cried all the week about her suit. Oh, Anne, I wish I could write like you, believe me. Wouldn't I score some of the men round here? Those booths are all might queer, said Captain Jim. Billy seemed the sanest of the lot till he got married, and then this queer jealous streak cropped out in him. His brother Daniel now was always odd. Took tantrums every few days or so and wouldn't get out of bed, said Miss Cornelia with a relish. <laughs> his wife would have to do all the barn work till he got over his spell. When he died, people wrote her letters of condolence. If I'd written anything, it would have been one of congratulation. Their father, old Abram Booth, was a disgusting old sot. He was drunk... Uh, He was drunk at his wife's funeral and kept reeling round and hiccuping. I didn't drink much, but I feel awfully queer. I gave him a good jab in the back with my umbrella when he came near me and it sobered him up until they got the casket out of the house. Young Johnny Booth was to have been married yesterday, but he couldn't be because he's gone and got the mumps. Wasn't that like a man? How oh, could he help getting the mumps, poor fellow? I'd poor fellow him, believe me, if I was Kate Stearns. I don't know how he could help getting the mumps, but I do know the wedding supper was all prepared and everything will be spoiled before he's well again. Such a waste. He should have had the mumps when he was a boy. Come, come, Cornelia. Don't you think you're a mite unreasonable? Miss Cornelia disdained to reply and turned instead to Susan Baker, a grim-faced, kind-hearted eller elderly... <clears throat> a grim-faced, kind-hearted elderly spinster of the Glen, who had been installed as maid-of-all-work at the little house for some weeks. Susan had been up to the Glen to make a sick call and had just returned. "'How is poor old Aunt Mandy tonight?' asked Miss Cornelia. Susan sighed. Okay, she was described as... grim-faced, kind-hearted elderly spinster. "'Very poorly, very poorly, Cornelia.' I'm afraid she will soon be in heaven, poor thing. Oh, surely it's not so bad as that, exclaimed Miss Cornelia sympathetically. Captain Jim and Gilbert looked at each other. Then they suddenly rose and went out. There are times, said Captain Jim between spasms, when it would be a sin not to laugh. Them two excellent women. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Anne's House of Dreams. That last bit needs to be copied because that was Susan's voice. Okay, back to the beginning. Doop, save. Thanks, guys.